Trigger on! Welcome, d roll to the Dark Face Diaries. We are World Trigger Read-Through Podcast, aiming to discuss the World Trigger manga volume by volume. I'm Wensley Dale Cheddar. And I'm Hoven with an H, and this month we'll be tackling volume 5 of the World Trigger manga, which covers chapters 35 to 43, and if you're following along with the anime, that's episodes 18 to 21. So, Wensley Dale... We're uh, posting this up a little bit later in the month than usual, so I, I guess we could clarify a bit for why that is. I think we've both we've both had a few holdups on either of our ends, haven't we? Yeah. Okay. I was expecting uh, you to ask me how am I doing badly. It's not too badly this month. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I still get the usual uh, depressive slumps all the time. But been concentrating on finishing my thesis, uh, my MA thesis, and um, it's done. I still have to defend it, but it's done, so it's one less thing to worry about. But at the same time, it has affected my ability to pump out content. I was going to record and post one patron request, uh, requested podcast earlier, but haven't managed to. If I manage to graduate, I'm going to uh, have to start looking for something full-time. So it, I might have to scale back the channel to uh, one podcast a month. So basically, Duckface Diary plus any patron request as a bonus. Yeah, and uh, on my end, I've just... Um, my computer broke down. And I didn't realise for quite some time that my replacement computer actually was able to record audio through uh, through Discord. So that that's my excuse. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're recording now. We're gonna we're gonna aim to um, stick to roughly the same schedule as before going forward. But you know, one of the nice things about doing a monthly podcast is that you can be really flexible with it. Um, as opposed to like having to follow a set weekly schedule. So today's agenda is a quick recap of Volume 5, uh, general thoughts, random observations, spoiler corner, and then our Q&A section. Just before we uh, head to the summary, uh, I'm going to say that World Trigger Volume 5 has been made by Daisuke Ashihara, translated by Lillian Olsen, uh, lettered by Ace Grisman, designed by Sam Elsway, and edited by Hope Donovan. It's time for the summary. So, when we last left off, uh, Kazama was challenging Osama to a mock battle since he wanted to see what Jins Jr. was capable of. Scruffy Hottie and Arashiyama tell him that he doesn't have to accept, but Osama figures they'll have to face him either way one day if they want to make it to the away mission, so he accepts. Tokieda is so kind as to usher the onlookers away so that Osama can inevitably lose without much shame, which he is generally very grateful for. And lose he does, 24 times in a row in fact. Osama notes um, Kazama is a stealthy attacker using, uh, using the lightweight scorpion trigger in form of double blades, in tandem with the masking chameleon trigger. Uh, the latter consumes trying continuously, which one might imagine works pretty well in a training room where trying supply is infinite. Kujihara in particular notes that. Osama figures out Chameleon is not invisible because, firstly, um, everyone would be uh, would be using it all the time, and secondly, Kazama doesn't seem to be able to use other triggers with it. So he tries to attack with asteroid bullets, just as Kazama charges for an attack. But Kazama is fast enough to cover for his weak point. It seems like Kazama has had enough, as Osama couldn't even touch him in the 24 battles they fought. But when he mentions uh, Jin's given up his black trigger for Yuma's admission, he's surprised to hear Osama ask for another round. Aiming to land just one blow in the last battle, Osama recalls Scruffy Hottie's lessons. So basically, gunner's triggers are bullets, but uh, what weapons they use affects the range, and if you don't have a gun-shaped trigger, you're a shooter, and that allows you to manipulate bullet properties at will. Being a shooter allows Osama to control power, range, and speed of his projectiles, and if he wanted to, choose more bullets since a shooter can only use two. He's weak, but he's not stupid, and he uh, needs those options to improvise. So, uh, Osama's pl plan is, he reduces the speed of his asteroid trigger, scattering snowflakes of Tryon uh, levitating around the training room, preventing Kazama from activating Chameleon. So Kazama thinks he knows how to uh, how to bypass that and prepares himself for asteroid, but then Osama activates his thruster, charging at Kazama with his Regus shield and pinning him against the wall. Uh, then Osama makes a single opening in the shield and shoots at the A rank attacker point blank range. However, at the same time, Kazama, Kazama stabs him in the neck as his reaction was just that quick. So the battle ends with a draw. 
Saying his goodbyes, Kazama acknowledges that despite his weakness, he knows how to read his opponent, and he says, I don't dislike the style of fighting with wisdom and creativity. Uh, Yuma asks if Kazama uh, isn't going to fight him, but Kazama just says, If you want to fight me, you'd better work your way to the top. It sounded a bit like Briti- like a British version of Christian Bale's Batman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure, uh, th- that works. So we cut to Chika, who apologizes for destroying the wall, but um, Azuma, a B-rank captain and the oldest regular agent in the base, says, It's all right, it was an accident, it was basically Satori's fault. He's the senior agent, that, uh, that's his voice. I didn't realise he was Santa Claus. Ho ho ho, me and Satori both have silly laughs. I've got a present for you! <laughs> that's Sniper's thing in this podcast. In the manga we also have silly hats, in uh, in the podcast we all have silly One Piece laughs. Ha ha ha! Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, when Kinuta arrives, uh, S- Satori says, Ha ha ha! I will take full responsibility! Uh, but that doesn't seem to impress the head of the engineering department. Uh, Kinuta is, however, immediately calmed as Chika reminds him of his daughter because of her small stature. It seems like Tamakoma too, as we'll now uh, call Osama's squad, has made quite a splash as rumours spread that Yuma has beaten the simulated banner in half a second, that Chika's blown up the base, and that Osama has tied with Kazama. Um, in particular, Osama is troubled by the rumours, as once again his, accomplish- uh, his accomplishments are being exaggerated. Uh, meanwhile, Yuma is impatient about his training sessions, giving him so few points, so he decides he should earn more by participating in the solo rank wars. Tokiida shows him to the booth where he can cha- challenge people to solo matches. In the border staff room, Kido sees how Yuma destroys a new idiot trio with Scorpion and Logic, and asks uh, why he's not using his black trigger. But Rindo sees through that bait, uh, expecting Kido to be searching for uh, a reason to take it. After discussing the topic of Chika's motivations, Jin arrives and they get to the main subject of the meeting a large-scale neighbour invasion. We cut to Yuma and Replica trying to figure out uh, how to operate a vending machine, where out of nowhere Miwa arrives and he's like, I'm no longer allowed to capture you and restore my honour, you dirty neighbour. Uh, Yuma offers to have Replica do some research to find out which country killed Miwa's sister to help him in his revenge, but Miwa refuses, uh, so instead y- Yunaya invites Yuma for a solo rank war while babysitting Yotaro. Uh, earlier on, um, a rank named Midorikawa inquires about Osama's connection with Tamakoma and Jin, and invites him to a solo rank war as well. Midorikawa destroys him instantly 10 to 0. When Yuma sees the young agent has attracted the attention of spectators, he gets about as coldly angry as a World Trigger character can be. He calls Midorikawa's bluff with his side effect, and challenges him to a rank war as well. If he wins, Midorikawa will treat Osama with more respect. Hoping. As Osamu's mind is blown by the revelation of the Yo Name crew, uh, the fight between Yuma and Midorikawa begins. Uh, we get these asides from Yonaya throughout it, explaining that Midorikawa has a lot more potential than him due to how young he is, but he also explains that there are downsides to him, that he's basically just this kid trying to show off these moves, whereas Yuma has a much more matter of fact approach to just finding just just find uh, just finding the strategies and using them probably as a result of his upbringing in in the field uh so the initially Yuma is losing he loses right away but then there's a very sharp turnaround and we get this very fun little taunt where Midorikawa at when he's got two wins is like oh we're if we were doing best of five I'd be one away from a victory and then when we get we reach the the five mark and Yuma has won the the following matches he lobs that right back at him like if this was best of five I'd have won uh, as as it gets towards the end of the match with Yuma just winning match after match after match Yuma makes a declaration that he's protecting Osamu's reputation on his behalf since Osamu's a bit dense and doesn't really know any better that Midorikawa is just trying to ruin it um, back in the boardroom meeting, we get Kazuma cluing the the um, the admins in on what's going on with that fight, since they've got them all the different monitors. Uh, and then we we cut back to the final match of the 
of the sparring match, and Midorikawa responds to him, to Yuma, that he does, he wants to stick to the Scorpion because he wants to actually see their difference in ability. So the match ends, and before Yonia can get that match that he desperately wanted, Jin interrupts. Uh, and so we get this very cute little sequence of basically seeing that Midori was just a bit of a kid, like he's constantly leaping to try and get like Jin to fight him now that he's an A-ranker. And um, we find out that he must have been he must have been jealous of Osamu for getting to join Tomokoma, and that's what motivated it all. At least that's what Yuma asserts when he learns that Midori Kawa is the Andre for Jin. That that's my interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Yuma makes this assertion that, like, it must have been jealousy, but we learned that Midorikawa, much like Osamu, was inspired to join Border by being saved by Jin. Um, the air anchor apologizes to Osamu, who then who then in turn publicly clears up the rumours about his title with Kazama, <laughs> and this is much to his relief, which I find <laughs> adorable, that he was just so desperate to get everyone off his case. <laughs> He's so happy. I <laughs> didn't like him bigging him up like this. Um... <laughs> They make their way as they make their way to the meeting. Yuma kind of goes into how he was approaching different opponents based on their behavior and treated Midorikawa more like an animal than someone calculating a logical like Kazama and purposefully boosting his pride in the first two wins to both cause him to underestimate him and maximize frustration to throw Midorikawa off when he loses. Uh, and Usamu seems to very much take this on board. They're guided to a room with a solar map where the executives explain that they're anticipating a large scale invasion and want Yuma's opinion on what countries might be attacking them with which sort of resources and weapons. Uh, Yuma puts forward Replica to explain this, who then reveals that they are a form of Treon soldier. Replica agrees to give them information, but only in return for Kido's promise that Yuma would come to no harm. Kido gives this, and Yuma doesn't react, implying that he's telling the truth due to his side effect, so Replica proceeds. So... Basil Exposition then explains that the neighbourhood is made up of a bunch of planet nations, each on their own orbits, and their ability to attack depends on when said orbit gets close enough to Earth. Uh, they provide supplemental data from Yugo's travel logs, which reveals a massive solar map, several times the size of what Border had on hand. This narrows down the countries the invasion could be to four options. A waterworld named Liberi, a cavalry-focused nation named Leoforio, an ice nation described as a superpower named Keon, yes. and the largest military nation in the neighbourhood, at least known to them, Aftokrator. Though Replica does then clarify that the errant nations with no set that there are errant nations with no set orbit, and that unknown nations are also possible, Kazuma and uh, Yuma posit that one of the larger nations is far more likely due to the use of Treon soldiers such as the Rads and the Ilgars, assuming that they're heralds of a larger invasion since not many nations possess them. Jin is of no help isolating the country since his side effect only works regarding people he's already met. Kido presses on a, the number of black triggers in each on the number of black triggers each nation possesses, which turns out to be seven on Keon and a whopping thirteen for Aftovkrator. For after Afro 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 However, Replica explains that the number of black triggers used would be limited since they're rare and typically used for defense, and humanoid neighbors sent for array missions would also be limited due to Trion consumption for the ship they'd be traveling in. So this this would mean Trion soldiers would make up the bulk of the attacking force. We get a brief cutaway to the Sniper Sea Rank Wars. Uh, fellow trainee Izuho Natsume is being quite thoroughly outperformed by Chika, but Chika still encourages her that they'll both make A rank together as long as she puts in the work. And it's such a cute panel when she does this. Aww. It's like it's drawn in a really adorable way. Um, and on the roof, Jin approaches Miwa mid brooding session to ask him for a favor <laughs> to save Osamu from danger foreseen by his side effect during the large scale invasion. Obviously, Miwa is resistant, but Jin tempts him further with the knowledge that he is under consideration to receive the Fujin, saying that he'll recommend him directly if he helps out Osamu. We cut back to Osamu and Yuma, with Shinoda approaching him them after the meeting to thank them, informing Yuma that his father mentored him years ago. Knowing Yuma's capabilities, he offers him a promotion to be a fully-fledged border agent. However, Yuma turns this down, believing border just wouldn't accept him, believing people in border wouldn't accept him getting fast-tracked without working his way up the proper way due to his being a neighbor. In a scene in a later scene of reflection with Replica, Yuma admits that if he ever thought he was actually in trouble, he'd use his father's trigger again, despite that painting a big target on his back. 
Uh, returning to school, Osamu finds himself to be the centre of attention with his newfound B-rank promotion. After Chika introduces Izuho to her teammates, we find out that Osamu's actions during the Ilgar attack have changed how Border allowed C-ranks to assist in evacuation and rescue. Just as they're reflecting on the 10-day window they have until Kion and Aftokrator leave Earth's range, portals open up all over the city. Yup, a large-scale invasion has arrived, and an emergency summons is sent out to all agents. Woo! That was a lot to get through. It was very dense. Yeah, I. this is making me wonder if we should maybe summarise these a bit more broadly going forward, uh, particularly with the arc after next but we'll see how dense the next arc is i guess um yeah so this volume sets up more plot threads to pay off in the arc after this i'd say or this is something that didn't really register to me on a first read because i guess it was the somewhat bad faith assumption i was making of the manga that osamu would be sidelined i kind of assumed he'd have a role similar to like it's not the best example, but Lucy from Fairy Tale, where he's kind of the point of view character, but doesn't really get any major focus. So I kind of wrote off his fight, whereas he he definitely th this definitely sets up what his approach is going to be in the rank wars going forward. I can't wait to see Osama in a bikini. Yes, we can't we can't wait for that uh, that beach episode, which actually happened in the anime, but we we may get to that someday. It, it was a pool episode, but still, it does also have setups for the the upcoming invasion. Obviously, the big chapter forty two is pretty massive as an explanation for the universe on the whole. Um, also, Midori Kawa it, it does have does play a big role in the upcoming arc, so there is that. Uh, what what are your general thoughts on the volume? Okay, so I thought this was a great transitional volume. It contained probably my favourite uh, fight in the entire series. So, Osama vs. Kazama is the first of these trademark uh, World Trigger tactical battles that our main character takes part in. And th the time um, that his fighting style and status as an underdog uh, are cemented, and it it's done beautifully. Uh, the multitude of points of view in the fight, both the contestants and the onlookers, uh, it, it's, it works beautifully towards its climax, giving us some twists and turns that you wouldn't expect with how simple this uh, battle is in concept. So first, both combatants made you make use of the infinity of Tryon, uh, Osama gaining the edge because of uh, re rendering Chameleon useless. Then Kitora expects Osama to control where Kazama is going to go with small bullets and then finish him up with a blast. But then Osama charges with his thruster, something so rarely used otherwise by shooters. And from the met context, it, it's especially interesting. It, it's especially very interesting use of framing because Kazama is the point of view character here mostly, uh, as an uh, and he does so as an overdog, and he's really the one we're supposed to identify with here. Uh, now, he hear me out. So usually it would be Osama being like, these characters are so powerful and my purpose here, uh, kind of like Lucy, is to make it seem uh, like the, uh, the even more larger than life. But here it's um, it's Kazama who's reflecting what the readers feel. Look at this underdog, this weakling who gets by on wisdom and creativity, while we are used to so much more as readers. Isn't it going to be interesting to see how he's going to develop as a fighter and as a tactician? What other imperfect but surprising techniques um, he's going to employ? I think... Ashihara himself has this absolute fascination with underdogs. That's that's really what makes Osama compelling. And this is why this fight is so special to me. Yeah, no. The framing... Another thing about the framing that's really smart is that Osama going in knows how low his chances of winning are, but does it anyway for the experience. So it, there'd be no point in, like, emphasising too much the internal monologue of, oh my god, he's so strong, because he already yeah. knows that. Uh, I like that he also partially games the draw based on the parameters of the training mode, which shows his aptitude for adapting to a given field. Kazama's speech of, like, very faint recognition uh, at the end, it really emphasises how much of a slow burn Osamu's working up is going to have to be. It's like, you know, after all that, what he gets is an, well, I don't dislike his style, per se. 
And this isn't like a Sundere thing. It, like, that would imply he was pretending not to like him. Kazuma is being completely like, that. this is what I think. Uh, he's, he's, he seems to be the most, but no, like, he's very much the most, he might be the most clinical character that we know so far, at, le at least as far as the fighters go. Uh, he claims to not even have an interest in avenging his own brother. Uh, I'd be curious to see if there was some slip to this, or if this was revealed to be more of a front than we realise, but, like, I do kind of like that as an element of his character. Uh, also, you get that, this comic strip that was featured in the volume where Kazama is taught that, like, the, oh, this is the way that, like, Italians actually use eat spaghetti, oh, and he comic. just kind of looks around and goes, oh, we're in Japan. <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> I... Uh, I do like these comic strips, especially the one I showed on Twitter and Darkface Diaries. Follow, by the way, to uh, telling uh, telling you uh, uh, what Christmas is. Oh, is it time for the Ashihara comments corner? Oh yes, okay, it's time for Ashihara <laughs> comments corner already. Uh, uh, we always get to the, uh, get to these first, apparently. I liked his comment of just like. I looked up. I looked up what turkeys look like for the first time. They're gross. Um. In in color, in color, the, the meat looked way meatier. <laughs> yeah. Um. Nah. Side tangent. Um. I think the better way to approach Christmas dinners is to vary up your meat behind whatever your country's default is. Like, um. What my family tends to do is that we go for goose, which is the more traditional UK one that isn't used much anymore. Or sometimes we'll just mm. do something completely different. Um. Uh, in Poland, we usually eat carp, which ha has a lot of very dangerous fish bones, so I always like eat it mm. within an hour uh, of just nibbling and uh, and and trying trying to find all the fish bones and uh, getting to them to to the side of the of the plate and and then I mean the meat's cold it's it's not i i i I fucking hate carp. Mm. I wonder how Kazama would eat carp. Uh, I, I think Miwa would eat carp. He would uh, he would think that's perfect for for his brooding because laugh is pain. <laughs> uh, the made up zodiac signs were an interesting addition. Uh, like it's that's that's definitely one way to flesh out your universe. Um, oh yeah, I, do, I didn't really pay attention to those. Yeah. <laughs> There wasn't really much to go on. I, none of them really like leapt out to me because it's not an element that interests me that much. It's just the fact that he included them. Scruffy Hotty and composed beefcakes, incredibly fitting poses for the chapter 36 spread. I like to imagine that this is just like Shiori taking a photograph of them all and just putting that to it. Just like, yeah, okay, composed beefcake, you need to have your arms folded. Scruffy Hotty, you do like a sexy <laughs> ooh -la, la pose with one hand on your head and one in your hip. We find out that border agents are also subject to capitalist exploitation. Only A ranks get uh, get a salary, uh, so B ranks get a fee per try and soldier they kill, while C ranks work for exposure. Tra trainees are unpaid work experience. Yeah, that's right. <sighs> Border shaking, shaking my damn head, shaking my damn head. Really. Um, also, if you have so, a criminal record, you you can't turn to border. That, that's uh, that, that's something I uh, I hmm. don't remember rem remember at all. Uh, th 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 that in that comment, the roast of Osamu continues because it's posted like it's phrased like, other than having a low tree on level or a criminal record, you won't get rejected. Osamu almost got rejected. <laughs> <laughs> and then like the three new idiots that Kuga Ko stomped are actually more talented than o Osamu, perhaps. <laughs> oh yeah, the, uh, oh yeah, this happens in this volume as well. <laughs> I did really like that comment from from. Uh... From Yuma as he warped into the fights, just like ah, that's idiot number three of the three new ones. <laughs> like I've been here before, I've seen your type. Uh, Raijin Maru is revealed in the Ashihara comments corner to be a gender fluid icon since, since uh, uh, yeah, an MB icon. What what, what do you know? Yeah, the, yeah the, um, they look female, but but everyone uh, everyone thinks they're male. They default to it. So, so yeah, um, that's a, that's interesting. Mm. So we had a we had a couple of clarifications to earlier things that we posited in this podcast, which I guess is a sign that I never read these volume recaps very closely uh mm. so one is the fact that why are all border agents so young i just assumed it was because border was made relatively recently but it's actually because of the age that your trion gland stops growing and the agents over 20 typically go into administration like sawamura you see that th that's what i don't really get does it shrink then after a while or was it just fuyushima and what was his name azuma uh, th that have like a giant resource of trion 
I mean, you know, if they were really being, uh, like, ethical about it, they'd just have them as cadets who just train their abilities in sparring matches, and only that until they turn 20, and then they go into the field. But no, they're, they're all about that child soldier lock, man. Another clarification, uh, not all operators had to be fe female, but they say that almost all of them are, because women... Uh, have higher parallel processing capabilities, and in contrast to this, almost all engineers are male. Um, Which means that, that all, all combatants are cano canonically non-binary. <laughs> all I think, snipers are bi-gender, all the uh, all the attackers are gender fluid, and uh, how, how about the shooters? What, what do you think? Hmm. Uh, I think all operators are from Venus, and all engineers <laughs> are from Mars. <laughs> That, that that's how it goes. Uh, Osamu probably never takes off his glasses. Perpetual glasses. <laughs> uh, why is Narasaka the bamboo guy in the mushroom f family? I, I didn't understand. Uh, I didn't understand this question. I I don't understand uh, how Narasaka relates to bam bamboo. <laughs> Narasaka's general presence here is very odd. Um, what's up with his popularity? I can barely remember the guy, and everyone else pretty much adds up. Satori being a little high is a bit strange, but it it doesn't really bother me that much. But yeah, that was the that was the poll for this episode. Basically, they had people send in actual chocolates to them and address them to the various characters, and people actually did it. Well, Sam <laughs> is the mo most popular, which I, I can understand. Yeah, he's he's big cute. Um, yeah, we, we were right on the nose with him being a harem protagonist. Yeah, and also just like the comments of "We are all on the road to obesity." <laughs> Ashihara, look after yourself, please. <laughs> then the smoothly smug Jin and enigmatically smug Yuma. And Satori, he's here too. Kinota's profile is both very surreal and kind of dark. Um, the spell, so the fact that he did a deal with the devil became an R&D genius to attain human form, which is why his cheeks get bigger every chapter, another clarification of something we've discussed here, uh, and the spell will be broken in the final chapter with him seeing a vision of his, his himself becoming handsome again, and reuniting with his wife and daughter, and while he dies at work. That is so morbid! What the hell, Ashiara? Oh my god. <laughs> also, I'm sorry, I, I just got to the second Valentine's Day ranking. So, uh, Ashihara runs out of uh, of the captions for, for the characters being popular, and so uh, basically he says, Arashiyama being handsome is popular. So, Kazama being short is popular. Uh, Shuji Miwa having a sister complex, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, uh, being the serious one, is popular. <laughs> to go back to briefly to like the Osamu Kazama fight, obviously this is really crucial. It's like, it's a really good way of setting up the mindset that Ozami has to the fights and I also just like um, what's his name sorry Scruffy Hottie's line of use what you have what the others have consider both sides and golds uh, the field positions positions of allies use all the elements and control the opponent's movement I could just like slap that on somewhere and be like that's it that's the series <laughs> <laughs> like that yeah. pretty much sums up the whole series approach to strategic combat uh, so, so a few things in the um, uh, in the meeting. Yes, Shinoda like values Osama's opinion uh, because of his experience with uh, Rads and Ilgars. Yes, it's something that, that I didn't consider, and I thought he was just there to accompany Yuma. But okay, see, okay, the way I read it was like. Uh, was that that was just the given excuse, and that Osamu accepts this because he's really dense, but yeah, no, that could actually be Shinoda genuinely acknowledging him. Also, another detail that I miss is that uh, trying soldiers on away missions can be stored in eggs, which does explain why why the away missions mostly use try and soldiers and and then a few characters that get introduced it's it's uh, it's a really good way to uh, not overwhelm your readers w with uh, mm. tons of new characters in a large scale invasion which ashihara yeah. kind of does anyway but <laughs> <laughs> again yeah cuz there's so much a border to, to to bear in mind um the neighborhood explanation tells us it, it's good because it tells us a lot more but it also leaves things very open with like the errant nations and the unknown ones so there are always little little new developments that can come out of left field in this conflict um and uh yeah and obviously all of this is just based around um all of this is just based around what the given characters know. We don't know how far the scope of the series is going to open up to, if there are, like, other neighbouring nations that go beyond even the ones that Yugo has encountered. Uh, that, that are, but we'll, we'll see, I guess. We'll see how much um, Ashihara wants to ramp things up. 
So a- as usual, I-, I have my standout c- comedic panel. Uh, when Kurasama praises Osama, Kitora emanates a dark aura, but, but uh, when uh, he said that uh, losing 20 times would get him nowhere, Osama starts sweating while Kitora brightens, <laughs> brightens up, but they are all in the same poses, so it's it's great. Yes. Uh, uh, and also an- another one is uh, Yuma saying, wow, a hole, J- just in-, in the background observing what Chika did. <laughs> I want to get that. Other, other small ones. Uh, I like the-, the, uh, the-, the image of Jin sitting on the lower jaw of one of the dead Trion soldiers is a really nice one. Because uh, we get a lot of shots of him standing on top of all of the Trion soldiers. He's he's moaned down, so it's nice to see a more casual one. I really like Yuma's very rational attitude to revenge, brushing up against Miwa's blind prejudice. It's a really good way of unearthing its rationality. And just a good moment for how showcasing how direct Yuma is. Like, he's not fussed that Miwa just want, clearly clearly wants to kill all neighbours. He's just like, oh, you want revenge? Well, this is the way you could do it the most efficiently. You want me to help you? <laughs> so uh, about the Yo name crew, honestly, Ashihara, couldn't you just say you want uh, Yosuke and Yotaro uh, to be given a spin-off of the Bizarre Adventures, preferably with the ancestors Yosef and Jonathan? <laughs> Yosuke Shigeshikata. Uh, Yolene. <laughs> uh, Yoni. Yo- Yorno? Yorno. <laughs> Yorno Yovan. Uh, Osamu's co- classmate just commenting on his promotion to B rank at the end of the volume definitely puts a context to the time frame because just because of how we've been reading it piecemeal and it, it feels like it's been way longer, even though a lot of events are just happening very close together. So uh, we get, uh, during the explanations uh, uh, about Black Triggers, we, we get the the hollow-like Trion soldier uh, shown when uh, Replica... Yes, the one that killed Yugo. Uh, the one that killed Yuma. <laughs> Apparently maybe that's a uh, Black Trigger-like humours. Uh, this volume begins the gag of Yone uh, never managing uh, quite to fight Yuma in a rank war. I don't know if that happens in the future, b- but um, but if so, I, I think that's amazing. <laughs> All right. Just another note, uh, probably my final one uh, about the art style. Uh, it's uh, I, I've noticed over the course of this read through, Ashihara has like one weak point, uh, which makes his art style sometimes unnatural. It's when he draws characters from the back. I especially noticed that when uh, Yuma and Osama were talking in uh, in Volume Three uh, at the rooftop of the Tamakoma branch, and here when Kazama was just responding to Osama wanting another mm. round, it, it's like uh, he can't draw characters from the back because everybody is always standing upright. Nobody ever slouches, so uh, when they turn the head, mm. not much variety in in poses or general silhouette um it it, it always looks like the t- the torso is drawn from the front but everything else is drawn from the back uh, w- which is why it's it looks very un- uh, unnatural oh i do actually have um one more note for the ashihara comments corner uh it's not it's not a comment but I, just a general thing is going forward we're at a complete blind spot because i had these first five volumes physically of how i when i first read through the series and there's a long stretch where I, I, which I didn't cover on my reread, and um, I'm gonna be interested to see these these uh, these comments for the first time. So yeah, I'm completely in the dark from here on. Uh, shall we move on to spoiler corner? I have quite a few actually. Okay then, so let's get to spoiler corner. So uh, Osamu's comment uh, to be chosen for an away mission, Kazuma's someone we'd eventually have to fight. This puzzled me because is this in reference to the fact that they'd fight people on his level in the b rank wars is it a reference to what the um invasion like trial test will be i think i think it might be just what we're gonna get in in the coming chapters i think at least that's what it suggested okay so karasama to osamu you're weak but you're not stupid you're better off as a gunner so you can improvise i like that he's halfway there with osamu he knows the general gist of it but kitora had the missing piece to really like uh sort like figure out what osamu's best tactic would be and also obviously some actual combat experience to give some context for 
how she'd work out that he'd get that. The thing about him getting Spider is it's great because it does seem like, uh, although Osama doesn't always know uh, how to cover for his tactics in the moment, he's uh, he's better at planning a strategy beforehand. So that's kind of the difference between he, him and Yuma. Osama is better at strategy and logistics, and uh, Yuma uh, with tactics. Mm. Uh, Kido's pessimism on Tamako Matu's mission panning out and how Tamako Matu's mission will pan out is a really nice setup for what we know of his backstory now. Like, the world is crueler than children imagine. He's probably very much going on with his own experiences with that, of how he basically, he he, he, he adopted this very anti-neighbor stance based on what happened to him. Mm. Most of the uh, adult members of Border dying might have something to do with that. By the way, I've got a brand new, um, I've got a, I've got a brand new mini segment, the Ashihara comment spoiler corner. <laughs> da, oh da, my da, god! Da, da. Uh, so I just found this comment very interesting. Of Midori Kawa might be a juicy role in the future, which is um emphasis on the might because like. He does do, like, obviously there is always a chance that Midorikawa could have another role in the future, but, like, he's been, he's done, I don't think he's done anything throughout the B-Rank Wars. He's not really had a, had a, played a part. No, I, I think he's been a commenter once, but, but nothing apart from that. Um, uh, we haven't met Kusakabe squad at all, uh, which is, what, uh, like, one of the rare A-Rank squads that, that we haven't met. Mm. I suppose that in the in the trial test we're gonna we're gonna maybe see some more of them. Mm. And I will also say that um, having never read the volume comments going forward, I am curious to see if Ashihara's roasting lets up as Osamu improves. I've also wanted to mention. So there's another image I, I posted on Twitter uh, today about Yotaro g- g- going like uh, when she already asked him, "Wait, where where is my cousin? Where is Yosuke?" And uh, Yotaro is like very darkly, "He served his purpose." I wonder if that's a reflection of uh, of him acting like a prince. Yeah, it could be. Probably not, but because because like he didn't grow up as a prince as, as, since he since he arrived on Earth when uh, when he was a baby. But yeah, still. So shall we do the Q and A segment? All right, let's get to the Q and As. The first one here is from Randall fifty five. Which other training sessions would you like to see? So far, we only see Yuma do uh, generic C trainee sessions and Chika do joint sniper trainings. I wonder if there are sword classes. Hmm. hmm. What do you think? Um, I mean, if we're talking trainees, I think a, a brief look at what the operator and engineer training would look like could be worth a look. Uh, if it's not that interesting, it doesn't need to be dwelled on, but it would just add a nice little bit of context. Yeah, I, I think that's a nice thought. Uh, other, otherwise, I, I think that would be a bit of an overlap in storytelling. I kind of like how how all Tamakoma 2 members improved in their own way. So Osama ha- had to ask around for help in different squads. Chika had to uh, mostly, uh, mostly do joint sniper training and... While Yuma was doing solo rank wars, so that's a bit of a variety that, that I like. But um, I could just as easily assume that um, that most C rankers and B rankers have joint trainings in the um, in their own classes as well. The next question is a spoiler question from Randall. Any chance that we'll see the other three nations that were mentioned in this volume? Um, I think it again. I've I've sort of. Like I said earlier, it really depends on how the scope of of World Trigger opens up. If the if like the focus remains limited to the after Krator conflict, probably not, because after Krator is the biggest military nation uh, in the in in the neighborhood, and it's very hard to have them easily travel to the other worlds without kind of breaking the rules set. It's like. It feels like with everything being dependent on the orbit, they very much set up the uh, the traversal between it to be quite a difficult thing to do. Uh, but obviously, if they perhaps, say, end up pooling the resources be- between neighbours and border, it could result in longer range travel between the nations. Um, 
What do you think? I could see that. I um I, I could see like them wanting to have an element of surprise. So the expected counterattack would be when after Krator and uh, Meden are in each other's orbits again. But um if like um if like Border would travel first to Galapola, then to Keon, and then finally would go to after Krator stealthily. I think I think that could be an easy like set up for, for more traveling stuff. Mm, yeah. Also, I just, I I like the idea of them going to the water world just so we can get a cannon beach episode. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, so Shiori could be, like, trying to nag um, composed beefcake and scruffy hottie to get into swimsuits and pose. <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe Kitora gets into one and asks somebody to draw her <laughs> so she can ad- have another pin-up pose of herself to admire. Uh, th- that that is very strange be- be- because um, I uh, I remember from the anime th- that she was much more bashful in the filler. Uh, so there's a bit of a discrepancy there. Da- yeah, d- damn it, Toei, you- you're you're getting the char- you're getting the characters wrong. Another question from Randall55. So, uh, what are your favourite uh, squad em- emblems? I like Karko Unit, Butterfly, and the Tamakoma emblem, aka the old border mm. logo. What do you think? Okay, so I think I'm going to go with Tachikawa Squad. I like the image of like the three blades and then like the slice. I'm not really sure what they symbolise, but they look cool. Though uh, so Tamakomas and Ninamiyas are pretty strong. I'm actually going to have to look them up uh, because I haven't checked them beforehand. But, but... Uh, no, I, I looked them up all before this. Uh, I typically like the um, the more shapely logos than like the crude drawings. I do mm. not like Kagayura's squad, which is this like image of like a wolf's teeth. It looks like a really, really naff T-shirt. I'm not. I'm not big on it. I guess it fits Kagayura Squad. It. Uh, <laughs> so I... it, it, Kag- Kagayura Squad's logo uh, looks like uh, something that you could find in uh, in like a patriotic brand Pol- uh, Polish uh, clothing store. It's um. It, 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 it's it's so fucking edge lord. Yeah. See, this just looks some like something that like a really like I don't know like a hippie or a metalhead would would wear over here. <laughs> um. <laughs> And a, and a metalhead without very good taste. <laughs> uh, I do like a, another another really tacky one is uh, the Kusakabe Squad logo with like the basilisk a cockatrice chicken coloured with a gradient. Mm. I it's it's really <laughs> uh, I hate it and I love it. Uh, I will say like Miwa Squads is a contender purely for that comic strip origin we got from an earlier volume, and it's also not a bad looking one. It's kind of cartoonish, which I like. I do like Kazama units. Oh, really? I find that one really creepy. It's like you got this this like incredibly ominous eye just staring at you the whole time. I'd be so freaked out at my fellow squad members if I had that. Uh, I do really like that for the, that reason, it's especially since uh, since they're like the uh, the stealth battlers. The, that's uh, that's um, th- that's amazing. Uh, kind of like the in- the invisible eye of border. Okay. Yeah. No, I can see that. Okay, so the next question is from S2 the is a. Uh, volume five is really great for fleshing out the world before the big attack. What do you think about the way characters were introduced and how their roles evolved throughout the story? Do any of the portrayals make more sense in hindsight? Kazama's very so. I guess the two big ones are this is the es- proper establishing volume for Kazama, and obviously the introduction of Midori Kawa. Kazama has been very much treated as a bit player, which I think is in line with how World Trigger likes to treat its ensemble. Like, you know, he had that involvement with um, the Galapola invasion and his little bits in the um, After Okrator one coming up. Uh, but And he also had his, his, his little moment as a commentator. Uh, he's not really played much of a role as a rival to Yuma again, that I can recall, but uh, that could well be coming. Midori Kawa, as I mentioned earlier, hasn't done a whole mu- lot, a whole mult since the large-scale invasion. Um, I'd say both of their introductions do make sense in hindsight because the way World Trigger tends to use its cast is that everyone is enough of a bit player that they can be filed away quite easily, but they can also be brought to the forefront very easily. It's quite fluid in that. 
I think Volume Five really f- fleshes out how um, how the dynamics in uh, in border are, the rank war battles, how the attackers, despite the differences, like uh, approach each other for solo rank war battles, which uh, which characters are usually c- called for for like staff meetings, which uh, characters are c- are considered to be to be uh, important as informants, as advisors, uh, as we've said. What you've said about uh, Midorikawa and uh, and Kazama being bit players and um, elements of a larger whole um, make make a lot of sense. I, um, reading Volume Five gave me more of an impression that we're supposed to we're supposed to cement uh, what the roles of Osamu and U- and Yuma and and Chiyachika to, to a certain extent are going to be. Yes, and they very much function as parallels to their approaches. With Kazama being very calculating and level-headed, and Midorikawa being more of a dexterous physical attacker, um, although obviously Yuma does have the, st- 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 the strategic edge on him. Alrighty then, uh, we also get a Q a Q and A session this volume. Uh, so uh, referring to the Ashihara com- comments corner, if you joined Border, how do you think you would fare in the Trion Department? Which I thought I think we um, I-, I think we answered last time. Uh, I mean, I've got a new answer for that. Uh, also, this is these are the all the following questions are from S two the Ize, just to clarify. Um, but yeah, no, I've I've added that my Trion would flu- so I've I've thought about it more, and I think my Trion would fluctuate widely depending on how much exposure to panels of Usami being great I have on any given day. <laughs> so on like the the bed that they lie down on, I'd just be charging up before the session with just volumes of World Trigger like lying on my face. <laughs> uh, and and then we of course have the second part of the question which is would you have the pain in your tree and body turned up or down and I think pain is generally quite useful in combat so I'd probably have it detectable but turned down um, then again I don't know what the sensation of having the attacks is like if you have the pain all the way down do you just not feel the attack or do you feel something that isn't pain I think you do, you just feel a, um, a little sting or, 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 or like tingling I'm not sure. I, I think uh, I think a future volume answers that in the plot itself. So okay. I mean, regardless, I think having a bit of a sting there uh, would be useful for keeping me on my toes and having me like react. So yeah, have it turned up a little, but not so much that I'd just be focusing on the pain and panicking and not doing any, th- not taking the appropriate action. Maybe I would have it uh, toned down because a hot take, uh, I, I, hot take, pain doesn't feel good. Uh, unless you're into that, but uh, yeah, don't, don't kink shame, yeah. jeez. <laughs> uh, all uh, right, and uh, I think that's the last question. So uh, that's so yeah. Um, shall we wrap up? Uh, so next time we're going to be covering volume six, which covers chapters forty-four to fifty-two, and episodes twenty-two to twenty-five with an asterisk. This is a public server announcement for all of you anime onlys. Gets a bit complicated from here because uh, we have reached the first volume where there isn't a neat cutoff point with an episode that ties in with the end of a volume. So episode twenty-five features the material covered in the last chapter of the volume, but it then goes into material we're not covering. So the way I'm going to handle this is each time I am just going to give the spread of material adapted, and you as a watcher can determine how you want to watch around that. So next, so the session after next, I am going to give the range of episodes starting with episode 25. So it's up to you whether you want to watch ahead or if you want to be spoiled a little by our recap. It's, yeah, basically whatever's, whatever you are most comfortable with. Thank you very much for watching. This has been the Volume 5 recap of World Trigger, the fifth episode of Duckface Diaries. As always, you can uh, listen to us on anchor.fm slash Cheddar or on youtube.com slash c slash Wesleydale Cheddar. But uh, we are also on uh, multiple other podcasting platforms, Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, Breaker, Radio Public, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Play FM, Pombay, Castro, Listen Notes, Google Podcasts, apparently. You can follow us on Twitter at Duckface Diaries or um, individual Twitters at Wensley Cheddar and at Hoven with an H. Yes, and I've also got my own podcast, Hoven's Hideaway, where I talk about miscellaneous things, mainly manga, 
That's on YouTube and on the various platforms mentioned as well. Google Hoven's Hideaway and you'll find it. We relatively recently put out an episode on the manga Kaiju Number no. 8, uh, so check that out. What is also something you might want to check out is the YouTube algorithm, a dark abyss of sorrows and woes from which videos like these never resurface. To help us navigate it, you can subscribe, like the video, or share it on social media. Uh, if you'd like to help me upload these on a regular basis, consider supporting me on patreon.com slash Cheddar. Especially if you'd like to get a shout out or your name in the credits, that's at the $1 tier. If you would like to request a, a short manga to be reviewed on the Manga Mosaic podcast, you can do so on the $3 tier. At the $6 tier, I'll draw your World Trigger duck face avatar like the ones we have here on YouTube. At the $12 tier, you get access to the show notes and, and the $25 tier you can request a series to be covered on a long form video essay. Each tier comes with a monthly manga thread covering uh, Platinum and uh, Assassination Classroom, Tokyo Ghoul and Siren respectively. Help us reach goals such as reviving World Trigger Bridge or more long form video essays like on Demon Slayer. Send us emails, questions, comments, suggestions at wednesdaydales012 at gmail.com. All right, so guys, this is the perfect point to join us. So uh, please share the podcast with a friend because we are just getting next time to the large scale invasion. This was the fifth episode of the Duckface Diaries, and as always, it's time to bugger off. off.